spread of COVID. Oh, I guess this meeting is being recorded. Please know that this meeting is being recorded. Next slide, please. Um, in the clinical space, um, you'll hear about what's happening in EpicNet where we're testing phase two compounds for treating specific pain conditions. We also have um, a number of clinical trials and clinical trials networks focusing on specific pain conditions like back pain and pain associated with hemodialysis, but then a number of other platforms for testing um, treatments for a variety of different pain conditions. Next slide, please. Um, some progress that's in this area includes a, a real terrific data harmonization effort so that in all of these various programs, we collect data that can support future lines of inquiry and research across the different types of pain that we focus on in HEAL. Um, a, a nifty iterative model predicting um, response to treatment in chronic low back pain and an IND for buprenorphine in the treatment of pain for people undergoing dialysis. Next slide, please. Um, this is Kurt's area, so I'll just allude to it quickly, but um, a huge area of focus for HEAL is improving the options available to people who have opioid use disorder. We have three terrific FDA-approved medications, but we are also seeking to develop novel and more user-friendly options, and that includes really, um, I think it's over 60 programs in this research focus area, 32 new molecular entities, over 50 compounds altogether, and then also including research on vaccine opioids to prevent um, overdose and relapse. Next slide, please. Um, and we've already, I think it's even more than 1690s. I think we're up to like 18 at this point, um, exceeding our original goal, as well as progress in the biologics and devices space. So um, lots of research going on in this research focus area. Next slide, please. Um, we have research focusing on infants and children, um, infants born exposed to opioids, including best ways to intervene in their treatment and care, and then um, tracking them long-term to see the consequences of opioid exposure on the developing brain. Um, there's a lot of innovation going on in this area, and so we also support research on non-pharmacological treatments for these infants and ways of imaging their brains, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, in the prevention space, I'm just going to really quickly tell you that we have some research on opioid registries to um, come up with patterns for our opioid tapering, um, predicting who's likely to develop opioid misuse or addiction, and providing information to pharmacists, um, a partner that we don't often work with on opioid misuse and addiction. Next slide, please. Um, in the translation of research to practice, this is taking the research that we already have, the evidence, and putting it into place in communities where people come seeking help. So that is criminal justice, um, primary care, places um, that may not be sharing information about the life-saving um, medications and overdose reversal options we have. And these programs have yielded really terrific local communications campaigns, data tools predicting overdose spikes, surveys on perceptions of stigma and why um, research hasn't always been taken up in these communities and encouraging best practices um, for the justice community. Next slide, please. As you can imagine, COVID threw a huge wrench into our plans. We, we stood up a lot of research programs in 2019. They were just getting started. Um, recruiting patients, and then um, this became much more difficult. Um, it won't surprise you that our researchers were incredibly um, innovative and found terrific ways to connect with research participants despite the barriers um, brought by social isolation and um, distancing. And so that include virtual cooking sessions, um, user-friendly different ways of um, having research participants choose how they would like to follow up follow, following um, an initial session or um, discharge from the emergency department and lots of different ways of actually building on the opportunities we have. You can actually do physical therapy and see someone in their own home. So there are research opportunities brought by the vast changes COVID has forced us to reckon with as well. So next slide, please. Um, we also have a data ecosystem we're building, uh, making our data fair and allowing future discoveries on top of the many, many um, 
studies we've funded already, enhancing collaboration and providing an engine for future discovery. Next slide, please. We have an annual report. I encourage you to check it out. It has a lot more information about what I just um, told you about. Next slide, please. Our initiative, not just in the number of programs that we fund, but also in recruiting important partners to make sure that the research findings are taken up and meaningful to the people they're designed to serve. And so um, toward that goal, we have established a Heal Community Partner Committee. And I'm pleased to say that Chris Beasley, on, who's on this committee, has also agreed to serve on that committee um, that's made up of patients and advocates and community members providing NIH with input on key issues that are important to people with lived experience in pain and addiction and make sure that as our research continues to develop, we carry it out in a way that's meaningful to them and that incorporates the outcomes that matter to them um, and is disseminated and shared in a way that is meaningful to them. Next slide, please. And we just held an investigators meeting and lots of information will be put online about that. So I won't spend too much time, but the resilience and enthusiasm of the research community in spite of the many delays created by COVID was really breathtaking. And this community stands ready to take on new challenges um, in a changing landscape, polysubstance use, new appreciation of health equity issues and um, other innovative ways of building on the strengths of patients at, in our research. Next slide, please. And we continue to fund research. So for those of you who are connected to academics, um, the HEAL website always posts our open funding opportunities, and we have many that are open all the time, including for new medications to prevent and treat opioid use disorder and new um, therapeutics for pain. And um, just say that we, the teams have done tremendous progress in the last couple of years, but we're always looking to improve our efforts and make sure that they connect with um, other programs within the initiative and other efforts in industry and beyond. So that's why we asked um, FNH to work with all of you on this um, agenda and the interviews that you've held to date. So I'll stop there and hand it over to you, Joe. Okay, thank you very much. So that was great. And as I said, there's a, you know, just the amount compared to the three years ago when this was just starting was, is, is impressive. Um, so uh, great work, everyone, and uh, let's keep going. Um, the next stage, the next uh, agenda item is an update review of EpicNet. And that's gonna be presented uh, by Dr. Linda Porter. And uh, with that, I am going to, um, ask her if she could, I'm sorry, I ask her if she could, uh, she and, and Dr. Karp could uh, take it for the next section. Linda? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, happy to jump in here. And um, I actually am going to just start with a little bit of a background, sort of take you back in time for all of those who are on the call that participated in the pre-heal strategic planning to develop a heal research plan. So your input um, was valued at the time. And I, I think as we go through EpicNet and the other programs, you'll, you'll see that it was really helpful in leading us to the structure and the goals that we have for EpicNet. Um, next slide, please. Can you move to the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so epic net conversations or the, the conversations that led to um, the recognition for the need for epic net, if you remember involved um, many of you plus our partners from the FDA and other stakeholders before we actually got allocated funds from Congress to set up the HEAL initiative. And so the conversations kind of went, um, discussed the problems um, of why we needed to develop a program like EpicNet. And, and a note at the time came up that one out of 16 compounds failed in the, in the pipeline for analgesic development 
over the, the 10 years, approximately 10 years uh, prior to the conversations that we had at the time. Most of the failures were at phase two in the pipeline. And um, so, you know, we recognized at the time that a number of the different, uh, different companies had actually moved away from analgesic development for many reasons, which were fairly complex, and you're all more than, you know, it, it's, it's not new conversations for all of you. But the, the hope was that a structure such as Epic Mat, um, which could help to accelerate pain therapeutics, would set up an infrastructure in which we could run high quality trials in a very accelerated fashion, they would be efficient, the trials could be done in an innovative way, and the network could be very flexible as far as um, really sort of structuring the trials to meet the needs of the assets that came in for development and testing. Um, EpicNet was also meant to be able to develop appropriate biomarkers for that phase of trials and endpoints. And also the hope was it would bring in promising assets, not only from uh, the pharmaceutical industry, but also from academia and um, be able to test those quickly and efficiently. And, you know, to be able to provide with success of Epic Net and infrastructure to do that, uh, sort of a long-term hope is that the industry interest in analgesic development would be renewed and more compounds would be directed to analgesic development. Also, I, we had a lot of conversations at the time about the regulatory hurdles that were involved when analgesics were tested in highly prevalent populations, heterogeneous populations. So these are obvious problems that come up when you're testing analgesics in different chronic pain conditions. Um, in people who have a number of different comorbidities, um, a number of different symptoms, and pain is complex, we're all aware of that. So the EpicNet infrastructure was developed um, with the notion that the trials could come in uh, for assets that could be drugs, biologics, or devices, it could be natural products, it could actually be surgical procedures was the original focus. The patients that came through trials, the intent is to do deep phenotyping and um, to, to look at pain conditions with high unmet need for pain relief. Again, um, you know, trying to bring industry back into drug and device development for analgesics. So um, EpicNet is designed to look at both acute and chronic pain. Um, to test these new treatments in phase two trials in a, a very rapid, efficient way. It's set up to validate bio, develop and validate biomarkers uh, through really, really innovative paradigms. And um, I, I, Barbara Karp is gonna jump in in a moment to talk about sort of the, the, the diversity of the assets that have come in and the types of pain conditions for those assets and, and the current state of the trial that'll be running through EpicNet. Uh, just a quick reminder before I turn the slides over to her is that EpicNet is set up on a, a hubs and spokes uh, structure. They are currently all up and ready to go. There's a DCC, a CCC who's been working hard over the last year or so um, to make the, the, the hub and spokes clinical centers um, sort of trial ready as the assets that were appropriate came in. So with that background um, information, let me introduce to you Barbara Carp for those of you who haven't met her because she wasn't here with the EpicNet team early on when we had these conversations. Um, Barbara has been at the NIH for a long time, the intramural program, um, working on issues such as um, central RBs. She's a neurologist and she joined um, the HEAL team to get EpicNet up and running and um, want so to take it through the clinical trials. And so let me turn now to Barbara and she'll give you some more details on where we are with EpicNet. Barbara, do you wanna jump in? Okay, thank, thank you, Linda. Um, so next slide, please. 
So EpicNet uh, opened to applications at the end of 2019. I had joined a few months earlier. And so since we opened, we've had 66 preliminary applications come in. And just a reminder, we have a three-stage application process. The first stage for the preliminary application is a six page fillable PDF getting only high level information about the asset. What is it? What's known about its mechanism of action? A brief summary of preclinical and early phase clinical work done and a brief statement on what the proposed indication is and what kind of trial the applicant envisions. Applications that are favorably reviewed by an external committee and then an internal administrative review within NIND, NINDS are assigned to work with a contractor to prepare the second stage application, which is the dossier application. The dossier is about 15 to 20 pages, a deep dive into the asset, basically the pharmacology for drugs, the device specifications for devices. That then goes for external review and internal administrative review. And the dossiers that are highly reviewed then go on to stage three, which is to work with our clinical coordinating center, which is at MGH to prepare the actual protocol. And that's where the study design is set up. So we ask the applicants for how they envision the trial, but it's really incumbent on our clinical coordinating center to build a trial around the asset trying to incorporate some novel trial design, some exploratory measures, biomarkers, and things like that. The protocol then goes through review, uh, external expert review, internal administrative review. If it passes for, through those, it's recommended to NINDS Council that reviews them. And then it goes up to the HEAL level, and then HEAL reviews it. And the final funding decision is made by HEAL. So 66 preliminary applications came in uh, over the past year or so that we've been open. And this is really a distribution of the types of assets that we've seen. And the, the uh, columns indicate percents, not numbers. So you can see that about one third were repurposed and about two thirds were novel assets, either drugs or devices. About three quarters were drugs, mostly small molecules, about one quarter were devices, and a couple of behavioral uh, applications or biobehavioral um, assets. About one quarter were from academia and about three quarters were from industry. And then we had a couple from some individuals who had a research idea they were seeking to study. And the majority, about three quarters from were from within the U.S. and about uh, one third, uh, quarter to one third were from international partners. And one of the things that I wanted to address a little bit was some of the reasons that preliminary applications don't move forward. So we looked at what the decision driving uh, considerations were for the assets not going forward. And about a third of them were simply not phase two ready. They had, didn't have the uh, dosing studies needed. Some of them had no phase one first, first in human studies completed yet. Uh, and some were missing critical information. About a third again were Me Too type drugs, which were just no improvement over the current treatments. Some had a very uh, weak scientific basis. Some had serious safety concerns. Um, some were simply commercially available and the applicant really wanted to pursue a new indication, but there was no clear need for a phase two trial in pain. Some were simply not appropriate for our network. They were biomarkers not related to pain, but related to some surrogate um, and a couple were opioids. So I'm going to get back to this a little bit later about how, how uh, we, we would like your input on how to address some of these concerns so that we might be able to target our applications better and move them forward. Next slide, please. We kept Barbara, this. I'm just going to jump in for a quick second to say we're a little bit over time. So if you can oh, okay, move I'll towards the fast. discussion okay. part, that would be great. Okay, but let me let me go very quickly through the other slides just to tell people what they are. So if you could go back a couple slides. One more. 
Okay, so our assets are mostly small molecules. We've had some topicals, we've had neuromodulation devices, um, parenteral approaches, anesthetic blocks, and biobehavioral. In terms of targeted conditions, the most common were, were acute post-surgical pain, usually for a bunionectomy model or a third molar uh, mod, uh, model. Uh, neuropathies were also very high on our list, low back pain and osteoarthritis. So there's the list of the types of conditions people wanted to target. Next slide. And this is the study that is currently funded. Uh, back second. So this is a small molecule called CNTX6970. Uh, if you could go back one, one slide, please. Um, and it's a uh, double, double crossover, people are, are double randomization, people are randomized to one of two doses of drug or placebo and an active control, which is celecoxib. And it's slated to start enrollment this August. So next slide. And one of the things we wanted to get your input on, one of the original charges to EpicNet was to explore master platform protocols. Um, our applicants are interested in this. It will help minimize our startup time to enrollment. We'll be able to achieve some efficiencies in terms of common procedures, equipment, training for staff. They'll already know the procedures and how to do this. And we'll be able to share controls, including placebos and active comparators. So for our platform protocol, we are interested in particularly developing it for neuropathy, which is one of the largest indications for many preliminary applications. It has a large unmet need and it would encompass many patients making recruitment pretty straightforward. And in particular, we were uh, interested in diabetic, uh, painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy as, a, uh, as our, our first uh, go through for a master protocol. So next slide. So one of the, so these were the questions that we wanted to get your input on. If you could go back to the slide, please. We wanted to find ways to enhance outreach. We had been pretty getting a pretty solid flow of applications in until the past few months. And I think what we're seeing now is the slowdown in research and in academia and in businesses due to COVID over 2020 is now resulting in fewer applications coming in at this time. So we need to really find ways to enhance our outreach and try to bring in more assets but we need to be them to be high quality assets. And if you look down to the bottom bullets, many of our applications are failing because the asset is not quite phase two ready. So we'd like to explore whether or not we should be providing some earlier phase resources to help applications, uh, applicants and assets get ready for the phase two study. So we're talking about maybe moving into the phase one B or to the earlier phase space. And the other thing we want to get input on is a master platform protocol. What would you all recommend that we kind of incorporate it as we go forward working on the design of the platform? So I'm sorry, that's pretty, pretty fast. And uh, if there's time, I'll take any questions that you have. So there is a message in the chat saying, how many applications have been approved to date? We just have the one study that's about to open up in August that has made it all the way through to the implementation stage. We have two assets for which the protocol is currently being developed. Okay, I'm sorry, there, there is a, another question saying of the submitted industry as, as, assets where they mainly startups or a mix of startups and larger, more established companies. They were both. I would say most came from kind of mid-sized to small pharma, but we've had some asset applications from large pharma as well. So Barbara, this is Joe Manetsky. I I'm wondering, and I, I think I missed it, and I'm pretty sure you said it, but how many total did you have? 35, something like that? Is that what you we, said? We had 65, 66 65. preliminary applications, but a lot of them just, so we've only had three make it through to protocol development. And that's why I thought it was really important to look back and see why things were being weeded out. What were the decision driving things? And a large number of them were not phase two ready. 
and a lot of those would have been uh, would would not have taken very much more to make them phase two ready, which is why we have this question about whether or not we should try to uh, see whether or not we can provide some earlier phase resources. Um, but the next largest group don't make it through because they're just not of interest to EpicNet. They were Me Too type drugs. They wouldn't really advance the pain field. They would be uh, often just a new new labeling indication, but not enough to really, uh, we thought, be important for what EpicNet should be focused on. So uh, it, it reminds me of what we've been going through, or at least we're going through in the beginning of COVID with Active and the project and all of the programs, uh, all of the, the um, therapeutics that were looked at by the clinical and preclinical team. And I know, uh, Walter, you were involved in, in many of those, but I, um, so maybe you can have a, a comment, but um, we, I think we went through something like six or 700 and, and in, in the end ended up with 12, or 14 that went into trials. So I don't know what that ratio is, but you know, one or two out of 66 doesn't seem too bad if you're comparing that to 12 out of six or seven or so hundred. Um, but but I don't know, you know, Walter, maybe you have some some thoughts about the pr approach that Active took and uh, and the approach that uh, was described here. Well. You know, I think they're, they're both emergencies, but they're on, certainly on a different scale. So when Active, uh, you know, launched, there was just a deluge of uh, things that coming in. And, um, uh, and I think for us, you know, that kind of sweet spot has passed. And now what we think we need to do is to kind of prove ourselves uh, to the biotech community, primarily biotech, and then hopefully big pharma, um, that you know, if we can get three of these studies done, high quality, published, um, that this will then bring more uh, assets to the table. Um, but it's clearly, um, you know, we think that we could probably run five at once, uh, but you got to work your way up. So if we get to three at once at the end of this year, that's probably the best you can do. But, um, but if we can get to three, we should be able to then add another one and then potentially one more. And then hopefully some of these will close out and they can be replaced. Uh, so, um, so, so to, to expand on that, Walter, one of the things that we had heard back from companies is they wanted to make sure that the network worked in some sense. And that's why we're incorporating positive controls into each of the trials. So each of the trials will include an active known compound, which for the Centrexian trial is celecoxib. If we go into a diabetic uh, peripheral neuropathy, then the uh, active control would be duloxetine, but that's mostly a control for the network to make sure the network will detect a signal because we've heard that companies are kind of waiting to, for us to demonstrate that the network can work in, in that sense. Um, so that's, that's part of it. Um, we've also heard, had a lot of interest from applicant, potential applicants when we've talked to them that if we had a platform trial, that would really be of, of great interest to them because it would allow us a, a really rapid uh, startup time for them. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, good. Potentially a good uh, point to go for a platform trial, large volume, patients, unmet need, and potentially a number of different agents to test. Okay. I see Chris uh, Flores has his hand raised. Thanks, Rebecca. Just um, with respect to the third bullet here in the last question on the slide, uh, my sense is that um, we should probably um, consider uh, providing resources for earlier stage um, programs. Uh, those who were involved will recall that we did identify uh, phase two ready assets as being in the sweet spot, but did also consider earlier as well as later stage uh, mm -hmm. programs 
um, for, for consideration for I think mostly obvious reasons. And um, the most important of which with respect to phase two readiness had to do with time. We, we all felt this tremendous sense of urgency. And so anything um, uh, before that stage um, obviously wouldn't um, have as an immediate impact as we all wanted. Now here we are all this time later, and I, I think it's fair to say we'd all like to see there be some more programs um, in the pipeline. So, uh, and, I, and speaking from you know, a personal experience, I know that at least one of the assets that we had submitted in that um, table that Joe prepared uh, was uh, looking for FIH enablement so it wouldn't have qualified here, but it, it was otherwise, you know, um, arguably a, a sound uh, program on the merits. So it might be interesting, even just as a preliminary exercise, to to go back and ask the question of those that were um, not approved uh, on the basis of phase two readiness. Did was there any other reason that would have disqualified them? And and if not, uh, maybe that would be. Um, grounds to consider uh, some funding there. I think one other comment just to make here um, quickly, because it, it seemed like most of the um, programs you were uh, talking about, Barbara, and, and in answering um, one of the last questions, suggested that uh, many of the companies, like, for example, companies that were waiting to see how the network operated and, and uh, QC issues, et cetera, continued to have a strategic interest in the asset. Um, in, in certain cases, I'm aware, certainly in, in uh, the cases for the programs we proposed, uh, there was, these were discontinued for business reasons and, and, and no other. And so in those cases, that, that concern would uh, evaporate and perhaps other ones would too. So it might be worth culling the, the list of submissions uh, for, for those that would otherwise not move forward because the company no longer has an interest. And so it, it's either this uh, program or, or maybe not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we're going to revisit, revisit that as we go forward. We've already started doing a kind of gap analysis of how many of our assets uh, would be able to move forward if we could provide, for example, a phase 1B study. Um, and, and we've identified about five or six assets where really that's all that they would need. And we feel that we could accommodate that within EpicNet if we were given the opportunity to do so. Cliff Wolf, I, I just want, would like you to keep in mind that we're a little bit over time. So please go ahead. Yeah, sure. I, the only question I wanted to ask is the biggest challenge is identifying those targets that have the greatest chance of efficacy. And I just wonder if there is some algorithm that you've developed, because frankly, the history of analgesic development is that, that uh, promising compounds from preclinical studies fail if, in the vast majority of phase two studies. So I just wondered if this, is, if, if this, this issue has been addressed. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not really clear on what the question is, whether we have an algorithm based on mechanism of action. Well, just the when you're trying to... Thing, right, Cliff? You're, you're saying how much it's going to really uh, have an impact. Well, it's just how are you going to predict when someone comes to you and says, I've got a, a new drug that I think is going to work in, in pain. Uh, I just wonder how you make that judgment, whether that is uh, likely to be true or not. You, if you have a formal way of assessing that. That's a hard one. I think it's something that the objective review panel is very concerned about. I can say that. And then the other piece is designing the trial in such a way that there will be data uh, that will, that will you know, provide information about that and making sure that that's built into the trial if it gets through that far. But up front, of course, it's difficult. Yeah, we, we just do it um, through this kind of stage review process to just get the best data we can to support the decision making. We do usually have a you know, measure in there, Cliff. So you know, for the trial, 
in the osteoarthritis, the, the measure is actually going to be you know, inflammation in the synovial fluid. So at least we'll know if we're affecting that. Yeah, we, we are trying to incorporate biomarkers and target engagement, uh, things, ways to assess target engagement and to see whether or not the proposed mechanism of action is actually what seems to be uh, happening in patients. But if you have a secret formula, Cliff, we'd be happy to see it. Sure. Well, well I, I, th I think one of the goals should be to try and identify which mechanisms are driving patients' pain so you can match the two. <clears throat> Well, that actually takes us right to the next next section of the discussion, doesn't it? So, uh, and and I, I guess there's a there may be a couple other questions, but I think we, uh, as Rebecca pointed and, out, and we may want to move yes. on. Rebecca, Joe, I also want to point out that Dr. Um, Tabak has joined us, and he, and he may wish to frame the um, biomarkers discussion that follows. Outstanding. Also, Dr. Stuckey has has joined, so I think we Perfect. now have a completely full quorum. So that's good. Dr. Tabak? Well, thanks. And um, I will uh, offer apologies for parachuting in and out, but uh, I can only stay with you for a few more moments here. Um, you know, I think this is a bit deja vu all over again for me. Um, and Cliff Wolf will probably remember some 21 years ago looking for biomarkers uh, to deal with uh, craniofacial pain. Um, and, and here we are, um, you know, fast forward to 2021, and um, we are still, you know, seeking the Holy Grail. Um, I, I think, um, so, so let me, let me uh, sort of throw the grenade and then, and then disappear and let you all figure it out. It, it is, is, the, is the state of the science sufficient to contemplate biomarkers because if if you want to argue that it is so what's taking so long and and i know it's complicated and, and i know you could all draw very elaborate complex mechanistic diagrams to prove that point but are we are we really ready to to sort of expend additional resources on something that has proven to be so incredibly elusive without any new insight. And, and maybe there are new insights that I'm not aware of, and it would be great for the group to explore those. But, but absent new, new insights, you know, or absent of, you know, an approach where you take everything you can find and put it into a computer and turn the crank and hope something comes out the other side. I, I really do wonder if, um, you know, how, how are we going to, how are we going to bridge this chasm that at least if, if, for as long as I know <laughs> has, has existed. Um, so, I, I'm, I think when you when you frame things, you're supposed to be upbeat and and very uh, supportive, and I've done the, the the antithesis of that. But but I but I, I really you know as I, as I observe this over the years, that's kind of where my my head is at the moment. So I hope I'm wrong. I hope you will all prove me wrong. Um, and so now, Joe, I'm going to turn it back to you to to figure this all out. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> I think. <laughs> okay, so um, actually, uh, Larry, that that was actually it does really frame what the discussions were with these interviews, um, and that we'll get to in a minute uh, because I think it really brought us back to reality. The discussions, which which is actually um, similar to to what you you pointed out, that there's still some discussions to be had. So. Um, what we're going to do now is move on to the next next section of the agenda, which is the biomarkers, and uh, and I thought it would be a useful exercise to give us a a really like a two minute reminder of where we were three years ago when we uh, we started to to discuss this. And as you'll recall, we all got together with you know in six six or eight weeks and put together a white paper. And in that white paper, a quarter of it was about biomarkers, and uh, there. The requests or the the suggestions as where where heel could make a, a difference was 
is shown in this slide. So there is a focus on pharmacodynamic and predictive biomarkers, a priority on those uh, to monitor uh, efficacy, uh, stratify, stratify patient, and, and actually quite a bit of an interest in uh, surrogate endpoints or, or objective measures of pain, um, which was a, a, a bit of a di di quite a discussion to replace the subjective measures. Um, and the biomarkers of interest were mechanistic markers and multiple, potentially multiple markers combined and quantitative sensory uh, testing. So this was the kind of, of discussion that, that started, or the, the results of the discussion that started NIH putting together HEAL and their first uh, steps into uh, their plan. Um, and what I'm gonna do, so this, that's, that's my you know, history lesson, so to speak. Um, reminder. But uh, what we're going to do next is I'm going to ask Amir uh, Tamiz to uh, provide a, a very short couple slides update as to, you know, what this, these thoughts led to within uh, the HEAL program. And, uh, and then we'll get back to the why we're, we're here again. So Amir. Thanks, Gerald. Next slide. <clears throat> so as uh, Joe mentioned, the initial uh, strategy was to really focus on biomarkers as a way to enable clinical trials uh, to study non-opioid pain treatments. And that was very consistent with the feedback that we had received from MDWG um, and, and many other uh, input that we had received throughout the process. So um, the, the, the pharmacodynamic biomarker as a way of um, uh, as a way of understanding molecular indicators of drug effect is, was one of the main focus. And a second focus was to uh, study predictive biomarkers to help us um, understand uh, and, and stratify at some level our patient population that could best benefit or respond to a treatment. So both uh, as a way of uh, enabling uh, clinical trials. Now, uh, we published two RFAs, uh, Mary Ann Pallimounter and the team uh, uh, representing 16 institutes uh, within NIH with four receipt dates. So the first one was a discovery and validation. We received um, over 50 applications and then the funding five, uh, nine applications. And we also had a prospective clinical validation. Uh, RFA, which we only received very few applications, we ended up not funding anything. Now, majority of the proposals we got were actually prognostic biomarkers, which was somewhat of a surprise to us. And that was a way to evaluate clinical or biological um, uh, characterization of pain condition focused on health outcomes or reoccurrence. A uh, couple examples, just real quick. Um, so we looked at uh, composite biomarkers, inflammation uh, relative to immune response for uh, sickle cell patients to see who would then uh, uh, continue to have severe and unpredictable uh, chronic pain. We looked at signature imaging um, to accurately predict who would recover for post-traumatic uh, headache. Um, and who may not. And, uh, and we only had one diagnostic proposal uh, for a diagnostic biomarker using confocal microscopy to, um, uh, uh, for, uh, for measuring neuropathic corneal pain. Now, uh, we haven't realized this, we regrouped. And as we went through the process <laughs> of reevaluating our therapeutics development for uh, non-opioid pain, we decided to introduce or actually include pharmacodynamic measures as part of all the, uh, all the uh, programs that we have. In fact, we, had, we held a workshop to, to uh, better understand what the status of biomarkers are. And in fact, uh, the workshop concluded uh, that uh, we really needed composite biomarkers, which were along the lines of the applications that we had received, which made a lot of sense. So if you go to the next slide, um, it highlights where we are today, which is along the spectrum of uh, non-opioid uh, 
pain treatments that we are uh, focusing on, all the way from discovery to clinical practice, there are a number of active efforts right now. Uh, early discovery efforts for um, analgesics development on the left. Uh, in the middle, you see FOAs for um, therapeutics development for preclinical. Uh, these are optimization type studies for small molecules and biologics. And then you have the clinical trials and EpicNet that you heard from earlier. So we have not integrated pharmacodynamic markers as part of all of these efforts, which makes sense, at least for now. However, the, the, uh, the gap that remains are, are, are um, the, the little box that's on the bottom right, which are along the lines of what we thought about originally, which are the surrogate markers and markers that are uh, uh, that would help us with, with the type of trials that we want to run. So next slide. I think that sort of leads us to what we want to do, which is this phase, which um, is allowing us to really sit back and rethink about where the gaps may be and, and what better opportunity than to uh, bring some questions to you as a way of understanding from your perspective where the gaps are. And, and hopefully we can uh, take this feedback and, and, and use it as part of the, the next iteration for what we can do for biomarkers. So back to you, Joe. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Amir. If you get the next slide, this is uh, just a reminder. This is for those of you on the HVC, you know what the interviews were about, but we interviewed 10 HVC members, which is essentially all of them representing all of the, the various areas. Um, and we asked each of them at least seven questions, at least seven questions designed to help identify these, these areas for future opportunities. Um, and particularly in advancement of, the, of a therapeutic because understanding that a biomarker doesn't, is used at every step, um, it can be used at every step. And we've seen certainly fruit through cancer therapy, uh, the more biomarkers you have at each step, the better off and the more efficient the, the trials uh, become. And so what we've done is collected the input from all of you uh, in these, from these questions. And we've, we've tried to summarize them in a way that we're, we can um, further discuss as a group and get a chance for others in the group to comment, other AP, HPC members, but also people who are not on the HPC, the NIH folks, um, et cetera, to, uh, to comment and or uh, add additional questions. And uh, what we're trying to do is provide additional info to the NIH because as you just heard, while they did uh, get proposals that were funded, they weren't all exactly what they expected. And so um, hopefully the, the discussion and the information gives them a, enough, a, a little bit more uh, background to, to better plan. Um, if applicable. So, you know, it's a, it, it, clearly it's up to, to NIH to, to um, do what they need to do, but what we're hoping to do is provide the very best information uh, to, to do that. So again, thank you all for your time uh, in putting these together. So the next slide is actually the first question. Um, and it was essentially in terms of biomarkers, what's the pipeline look like uh, in pain therapies? Uh, and, and during the answer to this question, we got a, a, several areas, mostly several areas of general agreement, uh, you know, responses of general agreement, which are shown on the next slide. And the, the top one is, next slide. This would be just about right. If, if, it's, if the thing's gonna break, it's gonna break with me. Um, so, can we get to the next slide or is we need to start over? Ah, there we go. So the, um, the general agreement was that there are not very many therapies in the pipeline. And really that's because the mechanisms that drive pain are still not known. And so the field is not ready for biomarker development. So I don't know if Dr. Tabak's still on, but uh, pretty much answers, partly answers the question right away. Um, there's, there's really, a, and this was consistent. I mean, I, I think this was not as um, emphatic three years ago, 
Um, there's, there's been a lot of people getting out of pain predominantly because of this. And it's really because of the underlying mechanisms that are, are really un, uh, not underst understood. And if they d we did have anything that could match patients with pain, that would be great. Um, and one of the things that, uh, again, we, we discussed at length at the, you know, a few years ago were objective measures of pain. I think there was a pullback um, in most of the discussions to say, you know, that would be great. It would be great to have a nice surrogate endpoint of pain or, or some sort of objective measure, but really what we need to do to get, get the, the process moving again is having some clear idea of, of the mechanisms. So that was the answer from the first question. I want to go on to the next couple of questions before we stop to, to have a little bit of discussion around this because the first couple of questions are are very interrelated. And so hopefully if there's no uh, disagreement uh, for that, uh, that would be, uh, I will continue on. So the next slide are what decisions will be most impacted or have the most impact uh, on, on uh, non-addictive pain therapy. And um, again, the areas of uh, general agreement are on the next slide, which is to benefit from those uh, uh, biomarkers that would I identify patients at increased risk of progression. So progression does come up as being something of interest. And we need to identify the uh, and enable patient stratification based on the mechanism. Um, so those two things obviously can be related as many people have said. Uh, but they don't have to be. Um, uh, again, as part of that discussion, it came up that the current state of the science may not support the kind of development of these biomarkers because we still are working with the mechanisms. Um, and that uh, this is where we started to hear a very clear message that more basic science investigations are needed to uncover target mechanisms. Um, target mechanisms linking to the biochemistry, the 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 biology, cell biology of the, pain, the very specific pain, pain types. Um, there were a couple of things that came along with these areas of general agreement um, that were not so much agreed upon. <laughs> so that's on the next slide, which is uh, some of the other things. So there were interwoven, not by everyone, but by a, a number to, a, a, enough to, to put it on a slide. Uh, of, of questions around, should we be thinking about these biomarkers, mechanistic or not, in terms of basic biomarkers of quality of life? Um, there was some interest in um, really thinking about the placebo effect uh, because some of the issues that are believed to be and are associated with difficulties within the clinical trial, uh, with running clinical trials and getting definitive answers is the fact that for pain, there can be, under certain conditions, very high placebo response. And so you, you have to have a very big, very long trial in order to, to be definitive. Uh, and then the other thing that came out of this, pro, this set of discussions was that the, there was a, a gap or a potential space for clinical and research fields to um, get, have, engage in more regular communication. Uh, because they're relatively uh, siloed uh, as it stands. And so that may be, was thought that it might be preventing some of the progress in the field. Now, like I said, these three were a little, were not the, you know, not everybody came up and said, we need to get the clinical and research fields together, um, but a couple did. And uh, so that's why this is in the further discussion part, as opposed to the previous slide, which pretty much everybody said. So these two questions, I think, really relate similarly to one another. Um, and I wanted to, um, I think it might be okay to, to stop and see if there's any questions here before we move on to the, the next set. And then eventually we're going to have time to really put all of this in perspective, discuss it all in perspective. But I want to make sure that nothing that's being said is, is uh, confusing. So any, anyone want to jump in with a question? And if not, then we'll move on. Um, 
So the, the third question was, if you have no pain pipeline, and this was directed towards those folks who um, mostly uh, had either companies that had gotten out of, of pain, which was almost everybody, and, uh, and or the, the, uh, the uh, research community. And the, the question was, is what would encourage both uh, companies as well as people uh, to get back into the space and, uh, and the types of biomarkers that would be most needed. And this actually, there was a, a lot of interesting discussions around this, but I'm gonna, we'll boil, we've boiled it down to uh, fairly straightforward answers, um, which you've already heard actually from what uh, Amir presented earlier. So the next slide is general areas of agreement. There's a need for diagnostics, uh, of to know what kind of pain people have or what kind of, again, this gets back to the, the mechanistic approaches, biomarkers that can be used for patient stratification and uh, target engagement markers. Uh, one of the things that descri was described with target engagement markers was that this is something that normally is done by a therapy sponsor. Uh, so uh, while it is a uh, it became it was an extremely agreed upon biomarker. It was also not something that um, everybody said, "Oh well, NIH should you know go do this." Uh, but they did say there may be situations where there might be tools that could be useful. But um, and and maybe that's something that can be be discussed um, within areas for further discussion. Once again, placebo effect came up. Addition, ad addiction potential. Um, I think this is something that not everybody gener uh, described, but uh, it's something that I think we uh, uh, it, we heard that uh, it sometimes is kind of an afterthought as opposed to a you know the something that's that's put into the the initial studies um, of a of a program. It's only looked at after you have a compound and you can put it into to animals and see if they're they're addicted or not. Um, and then there was interest in your neuroimmune relationship and relationship to pain, which we just heard from uh, Barbara that that we're and I just testing. And then there was a real a couple of of uh, really impassioned pleas for you know standardizing digital monitoring devices and and using them in in as biomarkers within trials. And so. Um, Simple, quite, kind of a simple question, but honestly, um, still a lot of open territory, I think, for things that, that can be done. And, and the question here is just which one will have the most impact in, a, um, in, in the short term, the long term, and where does, um, where does that, that fit in, in everyone's program? The next question was, uh, was in your experience, where, would these biomarkers be used? Um, so the the, the uh, categories we gave them to talk about were internal decision making, support for an IND package, phase one trial, or a surrogate endpoint. To a person, uh, everybody said this was an internal decision making issue, and that um, surrogate endpoint was way too much work, too much time, before it would be useful, and um, and really what most companies wanted was to be able to to uh, identify those uh, those marker those programs that had the highest potential internally and you know while that data might be shown to the 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 FDA or a, another agency is it wouldn't necessarily be there as a as a, a, a central player in supporting the package so um, really, that was uh, that's actually on the next slide. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead um, and, and said that. All right, so biomarkers uh, most helpful for internal decision making, and uh, the research field not really yet have enough evidence based for to begin validating biomarkers of any type. And so validation um, is is a is considered quite far down the road. That's when you're you're really making big decisions, um, potentially uh, uh, agency decisions. And, and so once again, the pain field, the evidence is not, you know, we hear the evidence is not there and we need more basic research on the mechanisms. 
Any questions around those two? Or, or, or anyone need any um, um, clarification? Cliff, Clifford? Yeah, uh, just to say that the possibility that a single biomarker may not be as valuable as a set of biomarkers, a, a signature, if you like, or a phenotype, um, a fingerprint, um, is that something that was discussed or considered? <clears throat> I think, um, so yes, and in, in, uh, it was brought up a couple of times that, that um, the, the likelihood that a set of biomarkers for something that is co as complex as, as pain would be uh, necessary, not just nice, but probably still necessary. Um, but again, that it came back to even the derivation of the beginnings of those sets of biomarkers is is still in its um, in its early stages and needs needs still some food from research results um, uh, and and uh, and we'll I think we'll get to some of those discuss those those questions on how to get there in the next couple of questions but but yeah it was uh, we weren't specific about the platform or you know how many genes or how many proteins or how many observations would need to be um, uh, used. But I think it was, it was clear there were a number of folks that felt that was, there, there was unlikely going to be a single one. And maybe that's, you know, again, getting back to um, our charge by uh, Dr. Tabak, that could be the main reason for some of the, the difficulty if, if um, you know, in the past, we've been looking for kind of that that one or two uh, uh, measurements that would would give us the the answer. Well, um, maybe that's asking too much of of a very complicated and and interrelated system. Yeah, I just want another question: whether you know CGRP story is an example of a successful biomarker in the sense that. Um, you know, it's it was if I understand it right. It was identified as um, as being leaked out into the bloodstream during migraine. <laughs> high levels up from the on the jugular from the side of the headache, um, and you know molecules that worked against it have now you know, been approved by the FDA for a treatment of migraine. So. I mean, it's is that is that something to aspire to? Meaning, you need to go very condition specific, identify the the mechanisms underlying the pain, try and find something, some measure that is, uh, you know, goes up parallel, down parallel with that mechanism. Um, and so, is the is there an answer really somewhere in the tissue? Is there an answer? You know, CGRP you could you can measure it in the bloodstream. Maybe maybe that's not going to be possible for some of the other pain conditions. But I just wonder if that's something to aspire to as a precedent. Walter, Chris? they did those studies in the bloodstream in migraineurs in CGRP, and one of the reasons why it took more than thirty years to implement it was because you can't look at a migraineur in uh, you know and just or select a group of patients and look at them and at their cgrp levels and determine whether or not they have a migraine so it's not a quote-unquote biomarker itself for migraine the, they tried in a bunch of different studies to do it in saliva in blood um and you know blood from different sources the inter internal jugular the external jugular systemic blood and it just did not work as quote-unquote what i think we're talking about here which is some marker you could look at in the absence of a treatment. Now, if you look at it in the case of, uh, you know, after antibody treatment, if you, if you sequester the, the CGRP, then you decrease the number of migraine attacks. But, um, you know, and so that maybe that is a case of a pharmacodynamic marker or a response, a, a target engagement marker, and not one that's a, a true biomarker of the disease. But, uh, 
it's a complex issue. It's a tough not to crack. And some, uh, Walter brought up the CGRP example. I think now is as good a time as any to make what I think is a vitally important distinction here. Um, as was mentioned at the outset, um, there are lots of different kinds of biomarkers. I think we've made good progress in many areas and ultimately um, the availability of a, a biomarker for a primary outcome, I think that the, the utility of that is, is debatable. Um, what I believe is most lacking in our field are valid targets. And this goes to the point that Clifford made earlier and has made many times before. Um, and so in the case of the CGRP story, um, CGRP was validated as a target. We, we still didn't have any better biomarker of, of the primary outcome measure um, in terms of patient reported outcomes. But uh, uh, I think what we need is, is um, valid targets um, that, we, that we can um, develop programs around. And, and just one last point here is that, uh, as was uh, alluded to, I think uh, a moment ago by Michael, uh, these are likely to vary um, across pain states. Um, it may not be as complicated as cancer, but it's certainly not Huntington's. And so we have to appreciate that um, it's gonna be a tough slog um, validating targets across all the pain conditions uh, we'd like to treat. So the idea there is that CGRP as a biomarker actually was a mechanistic stratification marker. Is that what you're saying, Chris? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, I, I think Michael made the point. Uh, it was It was observed that, um, uh, and, and by the way, uh, Andy on, uh, tells the story beautifully as, as he did at the National Academy a couple of years ago as part of this uh, effort here. Um, but uh, it, it was essentially not the, the kind of biomarker I think uh, is being aspired to here in terms of uh, being a, a marker for whether you're treating someone's pain or not. It was observed to be uh, elevated in migraineurs, for example, and, and we, we, so on and so forth. Um, but, but again, the main point I wanna make, and I think it's aligning with uh, Clifford's entreaties for a long time now is what we need are valid uh, targets and, and ways to validate targets. Other comments? Because I'm going to tell you that that walks us right into the next question. John? <laughs> you have a question? Say it again. Yeah, I, think, I think Chris has said it, but you know, in fact, CGRP, the changes in CGRP levels were really used as part of the support of the target validation. Uh, in fact, there the, 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 the weren't systematic measures of CGRP levels in the vast majority of the trials that actually tested the CGRP therapeutics. Um, so it wasn't even deployed in that sense, sort of from a biomarker perspective. Great, very important distinction. Um, so uh, we should, that's, and it's, it's an interesting, uh, interesting paradigm. Okay, so the next slide uh, gets into question five, which is, how can NIH clinical trial settings be most useful for developing a pain biomarker? And, uh, and we gave people several options of, uh, you know, to provide an appropriate setting for prospective trials, to, to identify and, and work with new, new biomarkers as a source of standardized samples, or in a, in a way to provide appropriate setting for definitive validation studies. And the next slide, uh, provides the, the, the outcome to that, pretty much everyone we talked to in the group said that the, it, it, they thought that uh, a new trial, uh, you know, trials that prospectively, that can be used to prospectively identify new biomarkers. And I would argue these two were pretty much everybody said one and two, uh, use those trials to as a source of standardized annotated 
uh, samples. And, you know, we got back to the, the issue of to validate a biomarker, you need to have them and have a, a clear picture on how to use them or what you want to use them for and the, and the background and wasn't there. Uh, the, the background science really, really wasn't there. Um, the next slide is the areas for further discussion around this. Um, and this, this fell into several categories uh, that, that were, were um, really talked around by, by a number of folks. First was you know, to set up collaborative infrastructures to work across pain uh, across pain uh, uh, um, indications. And uh, there was an importance to uh, mention to fostering collaboration between such things like on oncologists and pain specialists. So we've had some discussions around, you know, uh, post uh, um, pain, uh, post chemotherapeutic pain. Uh, and um, it, the people who are giving the chemotherapy aren't pain specialists and they're oncologists and the people who probably know the most about the pain that these patients are getting are pain specialists who are not the ones who are giving the therapy. And, and so there, there would be, you know, that's an obvious thing, but there's probably a number of other ways to do that. Uh, there, there was a, a suggestion to use existing biobanks to their, to their max and, uh, and, and potentially think about submitting the information to machine learning, clinical trial networks for prospective study and look at multi-dimensional measurements. And this is to evaluate pain responses, improvement, other things with known analgesics. So you start with benchmarks that, that people understand. And even though we're trying to walk away from and move away from opioids, they're still good drugs for pain. And um, they could be used for some of the pain mechanistic biomarkers, this was a, a suggestion. And, and that got to pain phenotyping, uh, you know, a, a more complete pain phenotyping that could be done in a network as opposed to in a, a single trial. And then finally, uh, we, we really, uh, pretty much everybody, but we talked around a, a lot of the differentiate people with chronic pain as opposed to just acute pain that eventually, that may be longer than some, right? So there's, there's probably a, a, something that could be done there. Not stated in, in this in any clear way because it, actually we couldn't figure out a way to make it uh, clear without walking through it was the idea of these trial network, that the trial network wouldn't be selective for a single pain indication because there was an, a, um, understanding or a, a, a growing understanding that some of the same mechanisms will be this will occur across multiple different indications and, but maybe to a different extent and so having the clinical trial networks look at maybe two or three three or four different indications but taking the exact same measurements in all of the patients so that they could be compared across indications would could be used to um, promote an understanding of the mechanisms that did cross indications and those that did not. Um, and the, the molecular changes that crossed indication and those that did not. And so that there would be an, a, a better understanding of which kind of therapies might be useful for multiple indications and which ones would be you know, very specific. Um, so that was, again, I'm, I'm still even not sure I'm, I'm presenting it as, as clearly as, as it, it came about, but the idea would be many pain indications were probably gonna ha share a number of, of mechanistic uh, similarities we need to set up the trial network so that we can actually identify those similarities. Um, so is that, I'm, I'm wondering, is that uh, completely unclear? And if there's any thoughts around that, um, that anyone wants to add to, um, and I, I can point to the people 
some of the people who might want to add to that, but uh, it, it probably would be uh, good to, to have that discussion here. So any, any thoughts about any of this? This was actually one of the questions that I think we had the most conversation about, quite honestly. Really, I was that clear, wow, okay. All right. Well, we'll save we'll save some of that to the to the. Uh... I think two participants raised their hands. Oh, did they? Yes. All right. I'm not seeing that. Sorry. You want to? Could we call on those? Uh, I can't. Stephanie, who I did just it? saw it, but I can't see who is raising their. Steve, Steve, Steve Joppy. Joppy. Yeah, Steve Perfect. Joppy. I, I right. them. Um, and first of all, my apologies, folks. Our cancer center's external advisory board is today, and I'm a program leader, so I can only join for part of this meeting. Um, on on the first bullet there, Joe, you, you said this, but I just want to highlight. It, uh, it in our conversation, it, it struck me that there, there are folks who work on musculoskeletal pain, and folks who work on neurological pain, and folks who work on different other kinds of pain, and they often are in different specialty clinic or different specialty areas. And ways to bring them together, you know, there's the one is the uh, oncologist and pain specialist as a kind of example, but the other is creating networks that work across different pain settings. Uh, I think would be very helpful in moving the field forward. I'm somewhat of an outsider to it, but my clinical observations is that pain is sort of scattered across a bunch of dif disciplines where it's a part of the practice, but not the whole practice, and there might be value to bringing them together. Terrific. And the, the other uh, hand up is, is Clifford. Yeah, I, I just wondered um, if there was any discussion about biomarkers for the risk of developing persistent pain as opposed to the presence of pain. Um, because we know that of people, most people who have diabetes, only a fraction go on to develop diabetic neuropathic pain, et cetera, and the same after traumatic nerve injury. And I think that that, that should be an element of our consideration um, as well. Yeah, and I think that's one of the, the issues that came up when we were talking about oncologists, um, because uh, particularly with um, chemotherapy, there's a pretty high I, apparently, a pretty high um, proportion of those uh, folks get get you know chronic pain from that uh, process, and that it would be it, that may be a good space to start because it would be a higher proportion than what you're talking about in in diabetic uh, neuropathy, you know, and in, and in fact diabetic neuropathy, some of its pain, some of its loss of feeling altogether, right? So, um, and and. It's hard to hard to know, but um, but at any rate, I you know I will ask the you know those who who talked about uh, chemotherapeutic pain to uh, chime in if they they wish. And I'm still looking to see if anyone's raising their hands or just sorry, just to to, to extend that. I think the something that MCATS is very actively engaged in is the utilization of. Uh, uh, iPSC derived uh, cells for disease modeling. And um, I, I think that has the potential at least of revealing um, features of individual patients, either susceptibility or, the, or the, the, the engagement of particular targets or mechanisms in their, in their, their disease processes. So this is Judy. I was um, involved in that first bullet and I, I wanted to just pre present the opportunity that many pain specialists are not working in the cancer field. And this is an extraordinary opportunity to follow people from normal, healthy living. They get the uh, administration of a chemotherapeutic agent that causes some type of damage to the uh, peripheral nervous system, resulting in severe chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. So that might be an excellent place to look at biomarkers and, and observe changes over time and actually look at the onset of a painful condition where we rarely get those kinds of opportunities. We typically see patients after they've already developed these painful conditions. And because the pain world and the oncology world are not often speaking to one another, um, not that there is any discord, it's just there are these parallel interests. Um, 
as a result, I think we're missing some extraordinary opportunities. And most people in oncology are being followed in the context of a clinical trial. So there's already an extraordinary amount of data collection, uh, biologic specimens being collected. The patients are fairly amenable to this. So um, that was uh, our, our conversation um, with Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. <coughs> Any, anything else, Marianne? Oh, Cheryl, yes. I just wanted to add, um, I agree with everything that Judith said, and I wanted to say that in terms of animal models for looking at mechanistic studies, uh, the chemotherapy-induced neuropathies are one of the most face-valid types of animal models because you can give the animals exactly the same thing that the patients are given. So I think that's also a bonus. Marianne, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to point out that some of the things all of you are talking about right now are actually about developing prognostic biomarkers, because um, these would predict the trajectory of pain after disease or injury. And in one case, from our HEAL biomarker program after um, taxane chemotherapy, uh, so they actually are valuable in terms of stratifying patients um, and giving people an idea on which uh, treatment would be most effective. So that area of study is being looked at right now. And that's why I, I know people have talked about prognostic biomarkers is not the best thing in the world to be focused on, but actually they, it is important in predicting who's going to be um, developing neuropathic or chronic pain. Right. Okay. So that I actually... have a sense of uh, you know looking at nerve fiber distribution in the skin as a marker for small fiber neuropathies, painful neuropathies. We didn't hear that detail. I didn't anyway. My understanding is that that's not, that an increase in fibers is not necessarily correlated with pain, whereas a, a decrease in nerve fibers in the skin is, there's good correlation with insensate neuropathy, but not necessarily the reverse. Okay, so we'll get back to this in, in the, the general discussion, I think. Um, because I think this is this may be a space to, to build on, um, but uh, based on everything we're, we're hearing. Um, the next slide uh, is was question six, which was actually a question that, that came out of, came out of um, the thought between uh, you know, uh, matching timing in it with respect to academic groups and uh, the development cycle of a pain therapeutic and and in reality, what we, we um, heard in the next, next slide was that timing generally is not, a, not as much of a problem um, as we can initially thought. The next slide. And that, that the, there are multiple ways in which companies can work with academia to address this and, and, and they, they do. Um, there's a uh, was some discussion around some companies preferring that the academic biomarker project be advanced in, um, in order to match the needs of the company, which which uh, is is means I think that means they were willing to to uh, provide grants, et cetera, and that there are certain types of biomarkers that just typically are done by the company, right? So this gets back to that first question that a lot of the that particularly target engagement biomarkers are going to be done by the company, right? So, um, you know, what we heard really here was maybe timing was not something we should put as a uh, a major major issue and and or a um, a driver of of uh, the discussion, right? So the the final question, uh, question seven, is uh, is was was kind of the if you were king for a day, or or NIH director or NINDS director or whatever, what what you think? Where do you think NIH could play uh, an effective role? Um, not 
that they should go and do that. But I, you know, all the, all druthers, where where would where did the the where did people see um, opportunities? Um, and honestly, they were they were when we went through this uh, again. This was a fair uh, a bit of discussion in in each of the the meetings, but it really comes back to this very similar identification or discussion that that we um, we had throughout, which is next, which sh is shown on the the next slide. Um, so facilitate collaborations. That was, you know, I think that's, and it's also something that NIH is doing, but, you know, and, but maybe bring in more pain research scientists and clinicians to, together. Um, really focus on mechanisms of, that drive pain. Uh, prospective trials uh, that, um, prospective trials uh, that were involved in collection of multidimensional measures. So Cliff, Clifford, that's uh, you know not just multiple individual um, analytes, let's say, but also don't forget imaging data and and various other um, aspects that could be um, added into there. Create network centers uh, to investigate biomarkers across all pain conditions, and um, create a repository or at least better use repositories. And then focus on translation from acute to chronic pain is something that has been discussed it, discussed um, in the past. And finally, focus on developing, standardizing, and validating digital markers, standardizing clinical trials to test multiple agents, so you know, a, a master protocol type approaches, and uh, spend some time thinking about neuroimmune uh, interactions, which I think, you know, these are all things that people have been doing for some time. Um, but but maybe focus a little bit more on cross cross um, uh, indications as well as uh, um, in in uh, in acute to chronic chronic pain. So these were, I think, when you know when you you, you look at them like this, they're they're very much reiterations of many of the things that we talked about and that we prompted them with the questions. And so that's that's good. Um, so they, we've already gotten that. Um, but I think these are these are areas that um, that you know the group felt the the HVC felt was uh, were had still some potential gaps and that could that could be filled or or, or broadened. Um, and uh, with that um, I guess we can ask, is, is there any questions, are there any questions about this particular thing? But if we go to the next slide, it actually is, you know, the discussion um, and we're going to, which, which we will now take, a, you know, we can have a, a, a good half hour or so to, to, to go through. And uh, within this discussion, I want us to make sure that we, um, everybody, and really everybody brings up, if there are anything that we've said that are surprises, is there anything that, that we're missing. We we had a lot of conversations. A lot of people said a lot of things, and so if something HPC member um, said or or thought of, and uh, we missed it, um, I'll take full responsibility. But please don't let me get past this um, without it being filled in. And then uh, priorities and and time frame of what what we think we need to do. Um, and at this point. I've talked a lot and I'd really like to stop for a while, but I do want to ask Walter if, um, you know, to get his initial uh, uh, thoughts and um, and set us up for this discussion a little bit, you know, more broadly, uh, particularly with things that you may feel were surprises and and what your thoughts are for, for priorities and timeframes. So Dr. Korshetz. Uh, well, um... You know, I would just uh, start off by replying to Dr. Tabak uh, by saying what he said was, this is a tough problem. I think we all know it's a tough problem, um, but, uh, you know, it's probably, seems to me, the biggest barrier standing between the pain science, which is, you know, going gangbusters and moving to translation, um, uh, you know, that bridge is where I think biomarkers are, are essential. Without that bridge, we're, we're in trouble. Um, and so 
how, how to crack the nut. You know, I was, you know, pushing people to throw out some ideas on where to go. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, we need, you know, we need, as, as was said, it's all about the targets. The targets are involved in the pathophysiology of the pain state, which is gonna vary between different pain states. Um, so I think to get, you know, really good basic science that al allows, uh, allows people to kind of pursue measurements when they're looking at, you know, at different pain mechanisms to also try and pursue what, what, what could we potentially measure that is a parallel to that pain mechanism. Um, you know, if you're doing that in animals, great. Um, but you know, it would be fantastic if, for, uh, if in some pain state in the preclinical space, we can make a measurement that then can be taken into a human, into a parallel human condition, and um, and and you know, in the animal models, we could try multiple different therapeutics with the measurement kind of being an assay for the effect and the efficacy of the therapeutic. You know, and if we can make that measurement in the human, that's that's kind of what I think is the holy grail in my mind. And I'd like you know people to comment. Um, but you know, I think in my mind it seems to be we have to go, we have to identify a really good pain condition. That, you know, as mentioned, you know, the chemotherapy induced pain. You have people before, during, after. Um, you could potentially do that in the animal. And, and then move into patients. Um, but some paradigm like that is what seems most attractive to me, but I'd like to hear what other people think. So, you know, just, just to comment, I think, once again, uh, the CIPM data has the usual problem that there have been a number of potential therapeutics that have been identified preclinically that have not worked out clinically. So. The extent to which the animal models are modeling the actual human condition is, is remains a little uncertain. Um, and I, I would add that the preclinical studies, I, I know it's my current obsession, should definitely include patient-derived uh, neurons, iPSC-derived neurons to model. They, it turns out for CIPM, they have beautiful assays where you can see the toxicity, you can dissect out the mechanisms and you can identify which patients respond differently. Um, so I, I just right. worry that the extent to which our rodent models are good surrogates of the human disease is, is something, some of them are, but many of them aren't. How would you go from the IPSC experiments to a measurement um, that could be made in people? Is there something that something that's secreted or some abnormal firing pattern? I, I can only give my my own example, which is in ALS. Actually, is that we discovered that uh, yeah. familial ALS motor neurons from patients were hyperexcitable relative to their isogenic controls, and from that we went into patients and. And in fact, there was a literature we didn't even know about where they are also hyperexcitable. You could actually yeah. measure that very readily and you could test uh, drugs that suppress that excitability. So that went straight mm -hmm. from the IPSC modeling, the disease in a dish, to the patients. You could not do those studies in the mouse because uh, right. the, 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 you could not pick up that phenotype. Uh -huh. Cheryl? Yeah, in addition to what um, Clifford is saying, which I completely agree with, there is under tap potential to get um, dorsal root ganglia, uh, spinal cord tissue, peripheral neurons, skin tissue from patients and from, from patients that are having resections during surgeries, uh, from patients that are uh, or, or donor cadavers where one can do electrophysiology, functional RNA nuke seq on these tissues. And I think that's an undertapped potential to, to look at 
targets that have been identified and, and validate, first of all, that they're present in humans and potentially that they're upregulated or sensitized in, in humans that have chronic pain. Right. So to that point, we actually did present in our last council a uh, initiative to fund just that, that actually that type of uh, research and, and um, the acquisition of that type of material from humans. Is that, is that public knowledge yet or not yet? It was presented at councils and councils public. Yep. Thank you. Cheryl and I have to declare a conflict there that we yes. wrote a little uh, review on this in Neuron. We do, yes. Well, that's why you're on this uh, BHPC. Um, it's not a conflict, that's, a, that's called an SME. So it's, it's <laughs> scientific or math expert, which is why you're here. So uh, other, other questions, other thoughts? Um, any questions of, uh, of the HPC from, from um, the, the NIH folks, besides obviously Walters and NIH folks, but um, I mean, the other other folks, Amir and Michael, Clint. I, um, I, I, I would like to hear some feedback you. on. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Amir. The, I just want to say thank you. I think the feedback has been quite rich, and we have a whole lot to think about of what tools we have available. Um, and so the feedback has been really helpful. Thank you. Like, of course, I want to say thank you too. But um, to Clifford and and Cheryl and and those of you on the um, the industry side, that interface between what we discover in human tissues and what we discover, and then what we can then go back and validate and study from mechanistically in in uh, animal in animal models or even just let's say animal tissues. You know, is there an interface there that is useful in the discovery and validation process, or is it just the human models themselves that that um, we should really switch to? I want to get your feedback on that. Um, I'll speak up to that, um, and then I and then unfortunately I have to sign off because I, I wanted to second what Cheryl said. That was I think really important that we have more efforts and. And um, I guess I would say um, a one, one, uh, one funded proposal isn't enough. I, I think there's a need in so many different ways. Um, and, and, you know, we're really taking the tack that um, the look for ways of bridging that. So um, it, it's not trivial, the ways that you do these experiments on, in, for instance, you, you know, um, excised DR, human DRGs is, is, is not, is, is not sometimes no obvious way to make bridges, but it's really worth trying because I I see getting that type of human validation of, of pharmacodynamic um, effects, um, you know, in, uh, electrophysiological effects as being sort of key to make that human connection and increase chance of PTS. It's there's there's no doubt we're in a in a tough you know pushing the rock uphill sort of of um, phase of research and. Um, and, and I, but, but I, I feel like I, I, this is an area that has been underdeveloped, this issue of validating with human skin samples, human nerve samples, human DRGs, and being able to come up with different um, um, targets or can make more credible a, a target and, or make more likely a target of success um, is fantastic. And it also gives you hints on, on biomarkers. I mean, you know, it, it may be something as invasive as a skin punch eventually, but the bottom line is, is that that, that tissue is critical to see um, it's develop um, human um, molecular specific biomarkers. So I just say the second and third, the, the motion to go down this path. So I'll just point out that uh, one of the, getting back to the, um, I, uh, question five, which was um, a perspective, tri perspective trials to identify biomarkers and collection of samples from all of those people. Maybe we can um, um, add that to the discussion as to um, how to maybe make sure that the 
uh, and whether that's that's actually possible to be collecting skin from even people that don't have skin pain. Um, is that is that something that makes sense? Is that something that's useful? And you know, what kind of things should should we could we be thinking about from from that point of view? So Cheryl, I'm, you're shaking your head, so I'm I'm uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to to comment further. Well, absolutely, it's possible. Um, we are now regularly getting tissue samples from our tissue bank when, for example, um, women mostly are going in to have a biopsy done for potential breast cancer, um, whether they're, let's say that it's negative, we get the skin samples that are fresh, we take part of those and freeze them or prepare them for RNA nuke seek. But the other part we just isolate into keratinocytes that we played out in, and look at functional responses of the keratinocytes. And one can do that from patients that do have different types of chronic pain. In fact, um, in speaking with the surgeons, I work with skin is going to be an ample supply um, when um, individuals are going under surgery for various types of um, you know, thoracotomies or different types of surgery, they can easily get skin. Um, it's harder, of course, to get the dorsal root ganglia, but it's also in times, at times possible to get dorsal root ganglia as well as nerve tissue. So skin, so skin is a very easy thing to get um, and work with. Uh, and I and I and it, I just wanted to say to Michael's question about bridging. So one example we've done is if you if you find a, a target in an animal model, and you believe that it's important, it's you look for it. For example, in the dorsal root ganglia with RNA scope, you can do exactly the same measure in sections of human uh, DRGs that are either from normal human donors or from donors that had chronic pain. And that is, in my opinion, that's much underutilized. i make a comment. Just one of the themes that we've been discussing is the identification of targets and the development of therapeutics and the capacity to see in patients whether those targets are driving the pain. And all of that is, of course, important. But I just feel I have to remind us all that uh, there's a massive push and MCATS again is at the lead of that, to develop phenotypic screens, which are not based on targets, where you're identifying compounds that reduce, reduce a disease phenotype without necessarily knowing exactly what the target is. And there may be a polypharmacology aspect to it. And it's just something that we need to think about that this, some of the biomarkers may move away from single target based biomarkers to ones that are more capturing disease phenotypes because those increasingly, I don't know what, it'll be interesting to hear the industry people if they agree with that, but at least academically, there is this major push to say that human cell-based phenotypic screens have the potential to identify compounds that target-based screens have failed to do. Thoughts from, from the company folks who have done high throughput screening on phenotypic screens. How about, uh, you know, Kurt, I know you're not a, a company folk, but you, you used to be. <laughs> no? Okay. I mean, the reason I, I bring it up is because I think there have been a number of uh, companies that that was very much at the center of, of their screening there are millions of compounds. I was part of that actually when I was both at Pfizer and Merck. Um, and uh, you, you do get things, uh, but, but you also end up with a very difficult, just as difficult a, a road forward because not you don't necessarily have to have a mechanism um, or you don't have a mechanism. And um, I think of P38 as being a, an issue where we had a phenotypic screen for an anti-inflammatory and it took 15 years before we actually knew what it hit. Um, yeah, I think if you, I mean, I, I'm not usually a, a strong advocate of phenotypic screens, but I, I agree with Clifford. If you, if you have a good phenotype that you can, that you can, uh, that you can somehow, uh, you know, map to the human condition, I think that's, that's useful. And, uh, 
I would also say the tools and technologies that are available now to deconvolute, uh, you know, compounds that come from phenotypic screens to try to figure out what sort of molecular targets they might uh, be working on have improved dramatically. So, you know, I think it has to be part of the overall approach, but I'm usually fairly, uh, fairly lukewarm. I've been involved in a lot of sort of phenotypic screening efforts in the past and uh, I've unfortunately have to report that haven't seen any of them really go very far after that. So, but again, it should be, should be something that we should think about. I, I can only agree with that. Uh, absence of a molecular target is very difficult um, for drug development. And, um, but having said that, if, if I took Clifford's point correctly and, and John's follow on, the, the access, emergent access to large phenotypic databases now, um, electronic health records, et cetera, provide an opportunity to do certain types of hypothesis testing that were not um, available previously. And, and then combining that with um, you know, genetic data databases and, and others may allow you to sort of um, you know, backdoor target validation uh, but a, a priori phenotypic screening um, in, in drug discovery is really challenging. So Joe, I had, an, I had another question, yeah. So we, this, I, I, we've had a lot of talk about target discovery and we actually started the HEAL initiative preclinical and translational program with that. And we have uh, more than 30 projects that got funded in that program. And um, I'm wondering for the industry folks and those you know, in academia who are on the call, who are involved in therapeutics dis discovery um, and development, what do we have to do with those programs? What do we have to do with the data coming out of those programs to inspire industry, to inspire those who are doing therapeutics development to take those on and try them out? Like, what, how, how does the data have to be presented? What's the forum for it? Or should we do workshops? Should we highlight it on websites? What, what, what do you guys think? So Michael, you're asking like if you had, so NIH has a portfolio of, of data on uh, specific targets that might be involved in pain. Is there a way that the companies would be more uh, amenable to seeing it? Or are you asking, is there specific types of data that the companies are, are making most of their decisions on? Yeah, I, I'd say yes to both of those questions. <laughs> how do we, uh, you know, how do we capitalize on these ongoing projects? And if we, and if we did more projects for some reason in the future, um, you know, what's the best way to translate those projects? I mean, getting the therapeutic development people to take advantage of them, meaning the targets that are validated. And that actually, I love that. I, mean, I love that you just ended with that. The targets are validated. John, Chris, Ken, what do you see as a validated target for pain? What, do you, what is considered in your world, a valid, yeah, don't laugh at me, John, you know, I mean, <laughs> I know it's a loaded question, uh, but if you could answer, you know, give us a hint as what you're looking for. I think you, you, you would hit uh, Michael's question right on the, on the head. Yeah, you, you, you rightly picked on me, Joe, because you said nothing, <laughs> so I feel like I have to say something, yeah, but uh, I mean, I think everybody has a, there are different definitions of what a validated target is. I think it depends where you can sit in the ecosystem. And uh, I think from the industry perspective, the, the ultimate validation of a target is actually sure that it works in a clinical trial, right? But that's, 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 that's I mean, that's an obvious statement, but it's, it's later than what Mike, Michael's looking for, kind of like what's, a, what would be a compelling data package to bring to you at an earlier stage of a project, right? And uh, there's, there's, I mean, it's a longer discussion than we have now. So there's no empirical answer, right? Because, you know, it's going to be dependent on the different projects and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so yeah, I'll just leave it at that. But it's not, it's not a simple answer. It's a good question that you posed as Michael. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways that academic science gets exposure to 
you know, to industry groups. And there's, no, there's still a very healthy flow of things across academic science and to companies across all sorts of therapeutic areas, right? So those mechanisms exist. Uh, Michael, you're looking for ways that we can kind of boost them or turbocharge them a little bit so that we're making sure- Or if I, NIH can help it. out. You know, if we yeah. did do, let's say a symposium or a satisfied symposium at, a, at the pain conference or at a neuroscience conference, where we just talked about um, targets that are in the, uh, you know, in various stages of validation, would that be helpful? Do you think we could get yeah. therapeutic development people to come to those type of workshops or conferences? Satellite I, conferences? I have no doubt that'll be valuable because, you know, you the more you can get public pub, pub, publicity for these things, you know, especially in the type of forum that you described, uh, certainly can't hurt us, right? And I will point out that that does um, connect in with with the biomarker discussion because the target mechanism is going to be a necessary starting place for a biomarker for that um, that uh, uh, patient group, whatever that may be, whether it's specific to a, an indication or not. So it's not so far off if, if those of you are thinking, why are we talking about targets? They're, I think they're, they're connected. Chris, did you wanna make a comment? Well, mostly I would agree with what John just said, and, and it's a, a, a much bigger conversation. I'd say, you know, just generally speaking, uh, you know, two of the major uh, methodologies, if you will, are genetic and pharmacologic. Um, those um, have already pointed at, at targets that um, arguably have, have borne out the predictions. So uh, notably, um, TRIP V1, um, based on the human experience with capsaicin and um, NGF as well. Uh, unfortunately, we, we didn't um, well foresee the, the target-based liabilities that have impeded the development of those. Um, in the case of NAV 1.7, I guess it still remains to be seen whether a therapeutic might be good for um, anything else um, beyond uh, the limited patient populations in, in which um, it was genetically validated. But, but um, uh, I would say that those are arguably still good um, ap approaches or ways of, of thinking about validated targets. I, I think um, Cheryl made a great point earlier about chemotherapy in induced pain um, uh, in terms of face validity. Um, I think uh, that uh, Clifford's uh, comment was equally well taken about um, failures um, coming out of those efforts, but those may have more to do with um, the animal tests than they do with the sort of um, biochemical or, or, or target types of information we might glean from those models. I think the bigger question coming out of there is how generalizable will the findings in, in that model be for other types of neuropathic pain, for example, um, but otherwise, I also like the suggestions that were made uh, with respect to uh, human sampling, whether that's skin or uh, DRG or what have you. And, I, you know, you probably already thought of this, Cheryl, but um, to the extent that, um, you know, post-surgical um, uh, scenarios are an area where we see uh, chronification Mm -hmm. uh, especially, for example, in mastectomy mm -hmm. patients, I, I mm -hmm. wonder if the, some of the work you're doing could identify, you know, biomarkers, promontory bio biomarkers for um, risk of chronification. That's a great idea. Right. Um, I like to use or one of the models, like speaking of face valid models, is the a skin incision, skin muscle incision in the paw. But another thing that is uh, another model that's even more. I think face valid from talking to surgeons is a laparotomy model. Um, so something to consider. And we've looked for lipids and elevated um, molecules using mass spec in the tissues themselves and the nerves that innervate those areas and seen upregulations. So that's one route to go. Could, could I just say, Michael, in, in response to your request and, and related to Chris's comments that I think equal weight in my opinion, should be given to identification of targets that drive efficacy, but also the adverse effect profile. And that should be really upfront right at the beginning, because if it turns out, I mean, for argument's sake, 
uh, sodium voltage gated sodium channel blockers should be perfect, except they act on every excitable cell. And so if you know that from the start, you throw out non-selective. Um, and if, equally, if you find a NAV one, conserve and select one, and you find it doesn't block action potential transmission in human uh, nociceptors, you also throw it out. Uh, so I think, um, I, I really think that we need to give be looking for biomarkers of adverse effects as well as the efficacy signals. Any additional questions? Any additional thoughts about mechanism markers um, for stratification or uh, things that had missed? I still really want to make sure that if a HVC member mentioned something or suggested something during our interview and I forgot to put it into the notes or into the, uh, to the slides that you please um, uh, let us, let me know, uh, say it now, but, but it, please don't forever hold your peace. If, if uh, it comes up to you, something comes up over the next, you know, few hours, few days, few weeks, um, let us know because we will in, include it uh, back into the uh, into the information that uh, Amir and and Walter and others will will be uh, using. Uh, to that point, Joe, I was wondering, Ken, can we call on you? You've been so quiet, and I know it, um, it's a special occasion when we get to talk to you. So, reflecting on the big picture and some of the work we've done historically, is there anything you'd wish to share with us today? I, I've been following the conversation, and um, I think I, I generally agree with the direction that the group is headed. You know, uh, it's a struggle with the biomarkers. It's not really my, my area of expertise. So I've been quiet and listening, um, but interested. Can I make Cheryl? one more point? Thank you. Um, this came up earlier in the conversation or earlier in the presentation, the need to um, uh, make bridges between the silos, between clinicians and basic researchers. And I think that, point actually should be pushed further because that is the route through which we can garner um, tissue samples from, from patients. And one route that I've taken is to present, to actually take a presentation, um, ask for an invitation to grand rounds in neurosurgery or grounds in grand rounds for plastic surgery and present my ideas. And when I do that, I get, I've found that the surgeons are actually quite excited about it and they are much more willing to get on board and very interested. So that's something that I don't know if NIH could facilitate those kinds of conversations and kind of bridges, but that's been, I think, successful for me and for others that have done this. So Cheryl, one thing that you did bring up in our discussion um, that I, I just, it's not really biomarker thing, but it you, you made the point to me, I think so uh, clearly that I, I just wanted to give you a chance to, to say, you know, you mentioned that some of your colleagues have been moving uh, because of the, their um, inability to actually get, get work done in, in um, in the pain field, am I not? If if I'm telling you, if I'm asking, saying something that you don't recall, um, mm. but there was a, the, I, I believe you said that there were people who were moving out of, of surgery um, because they just and, and pain in surgery because they were, um, not being supported, not being, uh, you know, that wasn't interesting. Maybe I'm I'm forgetting something entirely. So. Flash that from the. Uh, I'm not sure if that was me minutes. saying that. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure if that was me saying that. Um, I I think I've been you know just looking okay. for ways to connect with the surgeons and the clinicians that are actually treating um, patients. And the the more or well, what actually now I know what you're talking about. So what it is is um, and it's a problem across U.S. institutes, um, but the the fact that. Um, researchers in clinical departments often have to bring in up to 100% of their salary support 
So essentially they, they eat what they kill. And at my institute, they're not nearly as well supported as researchers who are, are in basic science. Um, departments, but the issue is that they are so close to the clinical um, folks that they can make, they, you know, and these are the, you know, even um, MSTP uh, trained students that then want to wear both hats as an academic researcher, but also a clinician, they find it very hard to be fully supported and well supported. So many of those that I am aware of are moving, just going into either being it, uh, only a clinician treating patients in an academic setting or even into pr uh, private practice. So the problem is losing this really important component of researchers that are trained as a um, basic scientist as well as a clinician, clinician and be able to do clinical research or basic research in a clinical department. That's- I knew there was a connection between clinic, yeah. the, the silos. And so yeah. I, I completely forgot most of it, but-, but um, I think it does does point out the uh, the uh, need to um, um, make sure that there's the the scientists, the clinician, whether they're clinician scientists, whether they're they're people talking, are actually there yeah. to um, to to actually carry out this work, um, and yeah. that they have the the backgrounds. and um, And a part of the reason I I tried to bring that up in a in a significant in, it wasn't maybe the most smooth way. But I appreciate it, Cheryl, because um, it really does lead us into what I think is the next section uh, of the agenda. And um, if we don't have any more questions or, th or thoughts about, and I thought we didn't, uh, about the biomarker space, I want to be able to make sure that we have time um, to, to go into the, the final uh, section of the agenda, which is uh, translational science training discussion, um, and um, and so that so um, let's see uh, if we if we can um, keep this discussion going at, with respect to um, keeping the the um, bridges open. And uh, one of my um, great favorite bridge builders is Christine Colvis at NCATS, and I'm going to ask her to um, to take over now and uh, present the her in, interesting um, discussion around uh, training. Christine? Thank you, Joe. And and yeah, thank you, Cheryl. That like really set this up uh, <laughs> for, for this discussion. Um, so I have the, um, the honor of actually presenting this concept to, to you guys today. We're hoping to get um, sort of your thoughts, of, you know, what we might be able to do that would strengthen and improve this. It's not something that's been, um, you know, it's not a funding opportunity that's been published yet. So there's still chances to sort of tweak and adjust. And particularly from the pharma folks who are here, we really want to hear from you and, and see whether or not this seems like something that you guys <laughs> would be interested in engaging um, on and, and what it would take in order to, um, in order to do that. I should say, I'm presenting this kind of on behalf of a a much larger um, writing group that, that Steve Pittenger has really been sort of leading and that Mike Oshinsky and myself, you know, um, you know, part of the, the uh, preclinical team um, that, uh, that he and I co-chair. So we can go to the first slide here then. Um, so this sort of is speaking to, uh, you know, Cheryl's um, point and, this is a figure that, that's actually from a, from a paper that Chris Austin, our, our previous director, and, and a few other folks had, had published in uh, Nature Reviews Drug Discovery a, a few years back. And it was really intended to illustrate how complicated it is um, and how many steps are actually involved when you are trying to develop a, a treatment. And folks on this call don't need to be told this, but you know, he's trying to communicate and those authors are trying to communicate to people who just don't have an appreciation for what it would really take to take a discovery and then, you know, take it all the way through to ending up with something that, that goes into the clinic and hopefully ends up, you know, becoming a treatment. And, you know, in academia, what we do when we're training people is we teach them to, to go really deep 
in a you know very narrow space. So they will learn, they will they will sort of cycle within a, a small part of this figure. And and in fact, unless they are given the tools for for taking, particularly on the preclinical side, for taking a discovery that they have on the preclinical side into the clinic, unless they have those tools their tendency will be to take something that they might recognize has a lot of potential, but to just fall back to what they know, which is that now we'll move on to the next publication and, and, and go on to the next study, and, and they won't be able to take it on to the next step. And then on the next slide, we have um, sort of an, uh, another issue that um, I think we'll, we're all sort of facing right now and, and trying to address, which is the lack of workplace diversity, you know, not just in biomedical research, but, you know, at really everywhere. But, you know, now we have sort of an opportunity to try to address this, um, particularly in this sort of translational space and thinking about, um, you know, therapeutic development and everything. And so, you know, NIH has, of course, a very, very strong interest in moving the dial in this space, but there have also been, you know, there's also been press from several pharma companies that have said that this is something that they want to help to um, address as well. And so we're hoping that through this initiative, this might be a good opportunity for us to sort of partner. So the next slide, um, um, is, um, that uh, the the research need that we are that we're trying to address here is that um, we want to provide support to early to mid career scientists, even to postdocs who have expertise in pain and opioid abuse um, research, um, but have them have kind of an immersive training experience. Um, for therapeutic development. And they can do this either in an academic or a government translational research center, or ideally in, the, in, in an industry setting would be another option for them. Um, and, you know, the idea is not that they're going to come away as an expert in PKPD or anything like that, but just sort of being familiar and understanding what are all the steps that, that one would actually have to um, um, go through. Um, and then, uh, <clears throat> and then as I, I had just stated that, you know, the other part of this to act is to actually try to address um, the workplace diversity um, uh, deficit that we currently have and, and we want to do this by actually providing a, a specific um, training opportunity for individuals who are from underrepresented groups. And, you know, we feel quite convinced that building a workforce of investigators who are better equipped to translate scientific discoveries um, into, into clinical uh, breakthroughs will be uh, really important to have that diversity. So um, next slide. Um, so, so the idea is for us to have two different funding opportunities, one that is general for scientists who are focused in pain addiction and um, overdose, and then the other is for scientists that are in pain addiction and overdose, but also from underrepresented populations in the, um, in the biomedical research space. And one of the important points of this is that the idea is that this funding is going specifically to the individual scientists. So this, these aren't, sometimes one of the things that NIH will do is it'll give an institutional training award where the, the money is actually going to the institution. In this case, it's actually going to the individual and we want them to partner up with a, with a mentor and with a site that can actually help them with um, to have this sort of immersive experience of, of you know, learning. And it could be, um, Cheryl, to your point, could be both ways. It could be that it's a clinical person who wants to understand what are all of the steps that, have to, that you have to go through preclinically before you would even get something to the clinic, or it could be, you know, a preclinical person who, who having a greater appreciation for what is being seen in the clinic and what the issues are um, 
and how a, a practicing clinician is thinking about treating pain can help them be much more insightful in, in terms of what they do preclinically then. And, um, and, the, and so this would be for up to 12 months. Um, primarily the, the support is to, to support their salary so that they can have sort of protected time to be doing this. And then, you know, probably a small amount for um, a little bit of, of research and development costs. So the next slide then. Um, so um, the objectives, again, just to sort of emphasize is that, um, you know, by focusing on early to mid-career um, scientists who have an expertise in pain addiction or OUD, um, that that we will build sort of this um, uh, sort of stable of of researchers with that expertise who also now have the the ability and the and the understanding of how translation would actually work. We want to cultivate this um, diverse workforce um, as well, um, and we think that you know that is going to be really important. Having that sort of inclusive workforce, you know, ultimately is going to be important for for really developing better medicines and for addressing a, a broader and wider population. Um, and the next slide, I think, ah, yes, and then and so. As I said, this would be for an immersive experience. The trainees would be, you know, embedded in in an environment. It could be in academia. It could be in government labs. It, at NCATS, this is something that that we do, particularly in the preclinical space, where we we can do everything from screening, you know, all the way through to IND enabling type work. Um, uh, Cliff had mentioned some of the, the ITSC. Um, stuff that he's been doing in collaboration with one of our labs. So, so it could be in a lab setting like that. Um, but, you know, particularly in this meeting, we're hoping to hear sort of from the industry folks of, you know, is this something that, that we could, um, we could engage um, industry partners in um, so that they can actually um, take advantage of that. And, I think one of the things that we that we want to avoid is somebody going in and being an extra pair of hands that help on one particular specific project without learning that sort of breadth of all of the different things that are going to be needed. So they might be working on a specific thing, but you know, and and a very you know whatever you can do in tw in a twelve month period on a specific project, but. Part of that experience is so that they understand, you know, you're jumping in here at the middle on this project. Here are all the steps that came before this. Here are all the steps that are going to have to come after this before we can actually get into the, um, into the clinic with this. Um, and then I think the next slide might be the last slide. One more slide. Um, yeah, so, so specific questions that we have for you are, um, you know, are there skills and expertise that you think are, are vital but often lacking when you are hiring somebody? You know, most people are coming straight from academia, or at least if you know when they're when they're first moving into the industry, they would be you know coming straight from academia. And so, what are those things that you wish that you know if they if they had these these skills or this knowledge in hand would um, have them able to hit the ground running a little bit better? Um, how do we make participation um, in something like this attractive to industry? And you know, what are the barriers that we can sort of anticipate for, for ha having that participation from industry? And then how do we ensure that the training sites will facilitate that training across multiple steps, like I mentioned, and, and not end up just going in and working on somebody's project for a, for a year? Um, and then, you know, obviously anything we didn't think of here on these questions that you think would, would be good for us to know and good for us to consider would be, uh, would be great. Um, and so with that, I think um, I can open it up to, to discussion from everyone. So can I just clarify, so this would be a year long. Um, training period, correct? And the salary? Yeah, up to, yeah, up to a year. Yep. 
Okay, and the salary would be covered by the NIH. Uh, right. Word. The, yeah, the salary of the trainee would be covered, yeah. And their travel. Within the, within, within the NIH limits of, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Wondered if you'd consider this in the context of K awards transitioning to independence as well, that uh, an interim step could be training somewhere. That's right, Clifford. So that's, that is um, certainly the spirit of what we are thinking is more along the lines of a K award type, type of award. Um, and you know, like I said, not, not like a, a T training grant that would go and go to the institution. Just maybe make one comment uh, on the yeah. Thanks for thanks for going through this. It's very I think it's very interesting, and uh, we'll we'll think a little bit more about how to how to try to engage with industry because it's probably not a simple question to answer right now. But on this first bullet, skills and expertise that are vital. Uh, sort of linking to Clifford's comment on you know the use and the potential of human IPS derived models. Uh, I think there's a shortage of <laughs> highly skilled, trained people who are actually very, very good at doing that. And we certainly find that on the industry side, it's very competitive to try and find individuals who have good experience there. So maybe trying to wait, deepen our bench a little bit to some extent with folks who have, uh, you know, the expertise across a variety of different, you know, cell models, cell types. And the types of readouts that we talked about, right? Maybe Clifford, like phenotypic readouts, uh, things like that. So that, to me, that, that could be valuable. Okay, that's great. So it's probably sort of model development <laughs> in, in general then. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I have her. Uh... <laughs> so um, just a... Uh, tangential comment. First of all, uh, Christine, great to see what you've um, recommended here, and especially with respect to the underrepresented populations. I think this is super important. Um, maybe to the general uh, issue of, of dying breeds, as I think Cheryl put it um, a moment ago in the chat, and, and you'll, some of you will recall this discussion came up a couple of years ago at the National Academies in the um, workshop that Story Landis co-chaired um, when we acknowledged the dearth of trainees. And, um, and so this problem, you know, spans uh, the food chain, so to speak here. Um, and it's being exacerbated from an industry perspective, at least um, to the extent that so many have exited the space so, so the, the expertise for some of these um, translational efforts, especially, is, um, is dying too. Um, and so one of the suggestions I made at the time, I'll just renew here in, in case it, it might be helpful, is um, considering uh, uh, student debt forgiveness as an incentive to enter the field, um, as was done in the HIV AIDS space um, decades ago, uh, and I think was, was pretty effective. Um, but but may, maybe more generally, any incentives um, to get uh, trainees of all types um, in, across all sectors. Yeah, Chris, I, I really like that. I appreciate you bringing that up because it isn't something that we that we have discussed. But um, but yeah, so that that is that's definitely very helpful feedback. Um, just something to say that I don't know if. Uh, I don't know if Cheryl has the same experience, but uh, certainly working in Boston with because of the activity of the biotech industry, I'd say a majority now of postdocs and, and even graduate students are not going into academia. So we run the risk in the future of deplete, depleting our capacity to do the academic research if most of our trainees go into industry. Clifford, I can 100% agree with you on that. I, it's actually shocking and, and depressing in a way. Um, and it's, they feel like academic research is just so hard. 
And it's going to be such an uphill battle to get their own lab started and get funding that many of them don't feel like they want to do it. And it's, and it's our future. These are, it's, it's our next generation, like you said, Clifford. And Clifford, do you, do you think that this pushes them more toward industry or, or that this gives them a, this gives them a path forward staying in academia, but, 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 um, you know, having that, developing those skills to, to be able to sort of advance yeah, their I, I, I think it's a balance. I think academics who are exposed to industry and have some sense of what, uh, what, what industry can do and its strengths, I think that's great for them, even if they go back to academia. So it's just getting that balance right of uh, yeah. to make sure that we can both support industry but and, and, and some of our trainees can certainly go there, but to preserve in the end the, it's just that's why I asked about the K award because I, I really would hope that the NIH will continue to identify those individuals who want to transition to independence and, and at least the scores for their first R01 can help them build up the lab, et cetera, et cetera. And, all, and as Cheryl said, I think most of them see this as being almost insurmountable and not giving up without even trying. A hundred percent, Clifford, thank you. They give up without trying and it's so frustrating because so many of them do have the talent. They just have been beaten down by you know, the, what they think is so hard to do. And they say, they probably say to you, Clifford, they look at you and how much you work and they're like, I don't want to do that. But <laughs> they don't realize how they still, they can, they can, it's not so, it's not so insurmountably hard. Yeah. And just Carol, do you think this is unique to pain? No, okay. I don't think so. I because I have people of all, or trainees of all uh, fields in our department, and they all feel like this. So it's not unique to pain. Okay, thank you. I have a follow on to that. Did when they go work in industry, do they work on pain programs, or are they doing something completely different? Real mixture of, of both. Uh, I, a lot of them just will take that training and just go into completely different fields. And um... Like one of mine is running clinical trials for non-pain related things. Um, there's a big interest in going into um, science writing for the lay public. Um, one of them's become a patent lawyer. They, you know, they're not staying in pain research necessarily. They perceive they want a lucrative career where they, they can just make it with their salary and they don't have to work insanely hard is their perception and don't have to be beaten down and beaten down and beaten down by rejection after rejection after rejection. So. Well, I love rejections. <laughs> I know these people sound crazy. I don't understand at all. Walter, is it, I mean, from an NIH perspective, that having people move between these sectors is, is a positive, but what we're trying to do is arm them with the knowledge and training to be successful towards our overall collective mission, you know, in our partnership. And I, um, going back to this concept that Christine presented, I mean, I think that the top question is still kind of fuzzy in my mind. What are the skills that you would wish for this to focus on? And, and where do you think the greatest opportunities for partnership would be? That, that would be possibly for a question for the more industry experienced folks. Well, I was, I was just thinking on earlier, uh, <laughs> I think when Clifford opened the discussion, you know, where are these folks going? And, and I was, you know, gonna half joke, well, you know, AI and other computer sciences, um, uh, which are, you know, quite lucrative these days. I can't speak to the, you know, work demands involved. Uh, but but the more I thought about it, you know, 
th there's an ebb and flow across uh, sectors and sciences. Uh, they come in and out of vogue. And I'm just wondering if maybe um, some thought toward more interdisciplinary types of training where maybe we combined uh, a pain fellowship in the context of AI, say for um, developing target validation algorithms, as was asked about earlier, or, or something like that, where we can combine some of these sexier, um, you know, areas with, with what we're trying to accomplish too, and in a way that meets the work-life demands that, that Cheryl spoke to. Ken or John, any thoughts? Um, I know people ask, but uh, do you think that there are companies out there that would be interested in taking people? To me, I would think it's what are they bringing to the table, right? And it seems like it could be like perceived as a big investment of time and effort by the industry, but and it and and an altruistic investment. But what are they going to get out of it? I know Biogen has a program where they bring fellows in, and from what I can tell, about half of them never go back to the hospital again. So they. Get they're getting good people. So uh, they, all, I'd say three quarters of my research assistants, my techs, go to Biogen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, so they, they make out like bandits. Right? Well, yeah, we've seen a mass exit from pain. the neurosciences generally, let alone pain, in, in big pharma, which certainly Ken and John and I can speak to at least uh, from direct experience. Um, fortunately, we're seeing now a burgeoning uh, new co uh, environment in pain. I think in part due to advances in science and in part um, tragically, but here's a silver lining because of what's happening with respect to the opioid crisis. The, the issue there is that, um, you know, th these folks are, are kind of lacking a lot of the, the, the training that we talked about is, is um, disappearing uh, quickly. And so uh, I think the challenge is, okay, it's great now we have capital flowing in, um, we have good science emerging. Um, how do we ensure that um, there is the expertise uh, around to, to translate those things into new therapeutics? Mm -hmm. Is the, is the 12 month time frame from an industry perspective, um, because that is a, you know, potentially a long, a, a major commitment. Is it, from your perspective, would it be more of, oh, it would be more tolerable if someone was coming in for three months and they would be sort of, you know, rotating through different different groups or, or does that make it actually even more difficult because it requires more coordination? I don't see that as a major roadblock per personally. I, th I think it could be three, six, 12, even 24. I again, it, um, I think it has more to do with there being a, a strategic fit. Mm -hmm. I would think that if someone came with um, IPSC experience, let's say from Clifford's lab, that would be an attractive thing for certain um, industries, certain companies, or let's say if they came from my lab and they have a certain high expertise in teased fiber recordings, if that was aligned with the company goals, that may be of interest or, um, yeah, I guess certain models or uh, ability to garner human tissues. It, it's all, I think Chris is right, it's all about the fit because the question I would have is what's the carrot 
for the company to want to do this. So there's the yeah. problem that presumably many of the projects uh, these individuals, these trainees will do in industry will involve confidential material which they can't publish. And, and yet if they're gonna to go to academia, to have a year where you can't publish is a potential problem. That is an issue. We try to manage that by um, putting trainees on, on projects that would be disclosable in, in publication form. We're, we're, we're uh, sensitive to their career needs in, in that regard. Uh, but again, making sure that there's that, that fit up front is the bigger challenge, I think. Well, maybe that's something that the NIH in, in funding it could specify that's a, an element of the training plan. Yeah. Yeah. Christine, do you have any other, Christine or Steve, any other thoughts or questions uh, that you feel like haven't been answered? Not for me, I don't think. This has been extremely helpful and um, really appreciate some of the, also some of the, the new ideas that we, that we haven't, um, hadn't been thinking about. So um, really appreciate that. Steve, I don't know if you have anything. Uh, no, this has been very helpful. Thank you. All right, back to you, Joe. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, thank you. That was a, a great conversation, and thank you very much, Christine. I think you you also have a couple of uh, of advocates on the on the HPC that you could you could actually t probably touch base with in the future. So uh, um, that's that's uh, always also good. Um, with that, though, I think we are at a, a point where we're, we're at the end of the, the agenda. Um, I'm going to ask Rebecca to um, come back on and we can discuss, you know, she can uh, close the meeting, um, discuss next, next steps and close the meeting. Thanks, Joe. And apologies in advance if I cut out because I'm having a bad, Christine and I are both having bad bandwidth days. But um, so it was terrific to regather this group and to um, hear from you some interesting ideas and, and extremely valuable input on these programs as they progress. Um, just to kind of quickly recap our discussion, we started with an update on the EpicNet. Um, program, which was really designed based on input from all of you ages ago, now it feels. And, and I think it was a theme for today's discussion that we started with what was most urgent um, and, and felt that sense of urgency. And we continue to feel that sense of urgency um, related to the opioid crisis, but you, the biology wasn't quite in our favor and some of the other conditions weren't in our favor. And so we're now looking across the, the portfolio and thinking this is a long-term effort. What are we working to shore up? Where are the areas of highest priority for building the kind of substrate for this research as it moves forward? And so for EpicNet, that might mean earlier phase trials or um, innovative designs for some, some of these trials so that we can gather more information as we test individual candidates. For the biomarkers program, it was a similar story. There were um, limitations in knowledge keeping us from moving forward in, in some of um, the biomarkers efforts that were originally identified as highest priorities. Um, and while that's difficult, the good news is that there are some innovations coming through both in HEAL programs and, and just more generally in the field that we can amplify and um, work, work alongside to hopefully bring about a better landscape for biomarkers research and pain going forward. And then um, lastly, we discussed the training opportunities. And I think that that was a perfect um, way to close because that continues to be the way that we're going to strengthen these collective efforts. We do need people who are able to understand both sides and um, move the program forward. And so I'm sure you'll hear more from Christine as that program develops and she comes seeking input um, along with Steve. So just from a procedural matter, 
Um, this is a working group of the HEAL multidisciplinary working group, which is a, a gathering of council members and um, individuals who advise institute directors. And so we'll provide um, both a recap of this meeting to all of you, but we'll also feed that information up to the what we call the MDWG when they meet in September. Um, and share with you any feedback we receive from them as well as um, future directions for each of these programs because I think um, some of them are switching gears and then at the same time new programs are launching that are going to give them um, some ammunition and um, future momentum. So I think that's it for my summary unless um, Walter or Joe you have additional comments. I'll reiterate my um, thanks and the thanks that you heard from Joe and from Michael and from Amir for all of you for taking part in the interview process and for um, your time for today's discussion. Walter, you're a... Uh, Sorry, please. just thanks, uh, Rebecca. Thanks, Joe, and everybody take, took part. Um, uh, this is really helpful to us as we move forward. Um, and I guess, you know, I think we, we didn't talk about it and we don't really know what our budget is going to look like in uh, 2022, but the president's budget, uh, which came out publicly, had a, had a pretty significant increase in HEAL funding. Um, so we should be able to do some um, really quite impactful uh, funding uh, in, in pain. Uh, and also included in increased funding to the institutes for pain research. Um, so, uh, so I think it's a on the funding side. I think we're in, we're in good shape, and and so this kind of input that you gave is uh, you know really really important. Okay. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Um, always always uh, interesting, and as I said, it's a, always fun to get this group together there. A lot of really good ideas and a lot of, a lot of smart, smart heads. So, so just remember it. the goal is to make to make Larry Tayback fail in his uh, his his uh, his concern his comments about biomarkers. Yeah. Larry, we know life is tough. What we want to know is what's a good biomarker. For <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, right. everyone. Have a good Thank afternoon. You. See you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.